So um, just as a reminder, we are talking about this sexual conflict case where the males can come in two varieties. One of them is kind of aggressive, nasty, more sort of elbowing, more, more something that is good in a mating context when it, get, when it is about getting fertilizations. Um, but it's not necessarily beneficial for the female to mate with such a male. So we have this random mating table, which is not the one that we are actually going to use because this is kind of like a what if scenario, what if mating actually was random, then you would get these kind of probabilities of the mating involving this kind of male and that kind of male. We want to figure out what happens in the situation where mating is not random because the big A males have a mating advantage. So. So what is this y uh, quantity, the, the sort of proportion of um, big A males among the mating males? Um, and the, the way I'm explaining it, um, so the first possibility in this table is this one here, where the female is big A and the male is uh, big A as well. Um, so this is actually, this text here, I was just being lazy, so I just copied it straight from my book, so there's a book on modeling biological systems. It's a bit old now. I, I, I wish I had the time to write a new edition of this book. It's published in 2007. But anyway, uh, there I explain to the students how to think about a kind of like, how do I get to this equation that I'm going to use here? That, so that the y is m times x um, divided by mx plus 1 minus x. So basically, remember what is small m. Uh, this m parameter, which is, it makes sense if it's greater than one, it describes the mating advantage of the big A males. Um, if it's equal to one, then there's actually no difference between the two male types. Um, so this quantity can no longer equal x squared. Um, okay, so the females, they all, all get mated. This is an assumption of the model. Um, they, the males are always eager to approach them and they always get mate it successfully, the females I mean, um, so that the probability that a mating female is big A, it's still the same as X. Their proportion in the population is the same as their proportion among the mated ones because no female get, remains unmated. But the mating male, for the mating males it's different. Um, so the, it is, um, has the big A allele with a larger probability than their proportion X in the population. And again, we define this as y. Um, and the way this, I think about this is that they, the males with the big A allele, they are disproportionately prevalent in that subpopulation of individuals who are mating. Um, where this equation came from? And now I'm going back to the example, which I haven't actually told you in this class, but it's in the book. There's kind of like, imagine that you're picking apples and oranges from a bag, and one of the fruit is a bit more somehow sticky or somehow more easy to find when you're sort of rummaging through the bag. So you get a higher proportion of one type compared to their prevalence in the actual bag. Uh, so if the oranges, for example, are somehow a bit more sticky um, and therefore more likely to be picked, and there's three oranges and seven um, apples in the bag, uh, so the effective number of the oranges is inflated by their stickiness, uh, which is this factor M. So the effective number of oranges to be chosen is 3m. The total effective number of fruit is 3m plus 7. So the proportion of times that an orange is chosen is um, how, you know, this is their effective number divided by all things that are competing for your attention in the bag. And this is the same idea that we are using quite often to model this mating, um, the elevation of the mating success. This is the probability that you are picked to be a mating male um, from the, when your proportion in the mating pool is x. So what, is it, what it looks like, um, it, it basically depends of course on this parameter m, uh, like how much better are these males at getting into the mating situation. Um, so if it was equal one, then it would just be the diagonal, obviously. So this is the proportion in their population and this is their proportion among the mating males. If m is equals two, it's already a little bit curved. Um, if it's 10 and if it's, well, there's the one, um, you can see that from like 0.5 here, you get all the way up to, I don't know what this is, something like 0.9. You can, if you're quick at calculating, you can do this in your head. 
Um, and of course, you also have to realize that the curve works in those cases where there's actually nobody there at present. Um, you cannot actually elevate your presence in the mating, among the mating males from zero um, if you are just not represented in the, um, in the population at all. And likewise, you know, this function shouldn't exceed uh, one at any point in time. So it works fine. Um, so what we need to do is actually quite simple. Wherever we see the Y here, we put this thing in there and then we simplify. And we have to next do a bit of extra work still because now you have to think about Mendelian inheritance. So there are these matings happening. Um, but if, for example, a female is big A and a male is small A, then you have to think, okay, so what kind of offspring actually come out of this? Because from each parent, um, you get um, the allele. But here, for simplicity, we were actually assuming haploidy. Um, and this was really just done to keep the, ex the sort of model quite simple. You, the equations don't become quite as long. And if we assume that they are haploid, then basically it's the same as saying, with 50% chance, you get your one allele from your dad, and with the other 50% chance, you get it from your mom. Um, so then we have to think about, okay, but how many offspring are these actually producing? So when you work through your ecological and evolution models, you realize that there are some things that you haven't really thought about yet. You need to introduce another parameter. Often they actually don't matter very much here because ultimately this is all about frequencies. So whether you get many or few offspring in this context, it's not so important for the moment. But, um, but it's just sort of good to check that um, if you put it in there as a parameter, then later you realize that it's actually not so important. Um, so maybe we are not so terribly interested in this total number of offspring that they're producing, but let's call it a big B, like for brood size. Uh, that's, the, that's the idea behind this letter. Um, and remember that we were assuming that it's costly for the female to mate with these bad, aggressive males. So if she's mated to a big A male, she will produce um, some fraction B multiplied by the big B. Um, and this small B is smaller than one. That's the uh, way we are modeling it to make it costly. So um, then we just have to think through all the different cases. Um, if the mother is big A, if the father is big A, then obviously we have no mutations in here. We just want to see how these um, alleles propagate to the next generation. So therefore, all the offspring will be big A. Um, whereas in this case, you split the 50-50 chance that you get your allele from the mother or from the father, and so on. And you could also look at this directly with frequencies, or you could, if you want to, you can say that there's some sort of total number of um, the females in there. In which case, um, you get to this equation here. So what do we have here? So we have all the possible matings that can lead to an offspring that has the big A allele. So we had four different mating, matings as a whole, um, but one of them is between the small a, small a individuals, and therefore you cannot get a big A out of that. Um, but you can get them if you have a big A, big A, in which case, what happens? All the offspring have the big A allele, so we don't have to multiply by half or anything like that. But we have to multiply with how many offspring are you actually producing from this per female. And this is the number of females, so this is how many offspring of this type you will get via that route. Then we have another route. We can have the mother being big A or the fa and the father being small A. Yes? Oh, you have two microphones. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm a little confused with okay. the um, with the notation with the okay. B and A. Uh, I don't know why it's not. It don't have to be like P. The probability A cross A is not A and not B. I, I don't know what what is what is B. And so, um, B, big B or small B? Both. Both. Okay. <laughs> Let's go back. Um, so big B, for example, if you have a fly that produces 100 eggs, it's the number 100. 
So, so it's an absolute number of eggs uh, that the female fly is laying. Um, but this number of eggs, her fecundity that she manages to produce, it's going to be a smaller number if she has been somehow damaged by the male behavior. And this damaging, I'm modeling with the small b. So if small b is, for example, 0.9, that means that she has 90% of her fecundity left, what she would have had if she had mated with a nice male. So in that case, um, the small b times big B would be 90, and the big B alone would be 100, Perfect. just as an example. Is, yeah, the notation just confused me a little because it looks like uh, alleles. Yeah, they are so not, they are not, yes. Um, so <laughs> if I was being consistent here, I would actually, so, I just realized that I wasn't always consistent. Um, the alleles are not italicized, whereas these ones, uh, that's kind of like general eco-evolutionary okay. notation that when, when a letter is notating a numerical value, you should put it in italics. And when it's just a label, then it should not be in italics. Um, and I noticed that I should actually go through these slides because I'm not sure I've been completely consistent here all the time, uh, but here, I think I have, yeah, it's actually a bit of a problem with a small a because when you write it in English text, then often it looks like just, you know, the article. Um, and I think in this book that I published, um, I convinced myself that it's maybe better if they are in italics for the moment for that reason. But, um, but here it could be confusing. But does, is it clear now? Yes. Okay, good. Thanks that you're asking questions, yeah. Yesterday, I thought we, we were assuming to, to simplify that all these organs are haploids. Yes. And the, and the parents, they are. They mm -hmm. they are big A. But now for the offspring, we are going to use, like, they have both? No, they don't have both. Um, it will be clearer when I put the next one in, next equation here as well. So this, these are all the offspring that just have the big A, only the big A. Their parents, of course, I mean, because you have two parents, we have to look at all the combinations. Um, you have two parents, but then we assume that if you, if you have, for example, this is your female, you know the notation females are often brown in population genetics and males are square. You can imagine sort of a male. <laughs> um, so so in, the, in the haploid world, if these ones make different offspring, then basic, it, it, it's what I'm, what I'm doing here with the equation is to say that the expectation is that, for example, here we have b equals four. Um, the expectation is that you will get two that are haploid and big A, and then we have two that are haploid and small a. But to figure out the number of these, I have to go through all the different routes of how such a thing can come about. So I'm, I'm not just looking at these matings. So this is the P A times A. I'm also, I also have to think that, so this all goes into the N A pile. This one also goes to the N A pile, but there are other routes that also bring things to the N A pile. And these are the matings that are like this. There's also some of them that come into that pile. And then there's, of course, the, well, it's not a logical order now, but I'll put it in the middle. These ones also go to that pile. And now this one, and then the other one, which is in small a. And there are different arrows coming to there, but but these ones, of course, these matings, they also, some of them will go into that pile. And that's what we are doing here when I get the equations back. Yeah. So, for example, um, this arrow here of these offspring being produced by the big A, small a matings, uh, I can spot that arrow in here, right? So that you can see that the half comes from the fact that half of them actually go to a different pile. And I should find that pile, uh, it's this one here. So the half of them that have gone to contributing to this kind of offspring is there, and so on. 
And now it's clear? Yep, good. So we have these numbers of different offspring of the type big A and small a. And what remains to be done is to figure out what is the x and then later the y um, of the next generation. So we, have, uh, we don't actually have x uh, directly in this. Uh, we, just have the, we, we just remember that all these p things, they contain the x and the y. Um, so uh, this is again text from the book. Where are we now? We know how to get from n and x to the p a times a and the other probabilities. We also know how to get the number of offspring from each allele n a and n small a once the probabilities are known. And then uh, the frequency of x in the next generation, and we just chose to call it x prime, uh, it's almost within sight. Um, so for example, if we are producing 2,000 offspring with this allele and a thousand of the others, then we know the proportion will be two uh, thirds. Um, and in general, kind of like if, if the equations feel too abstract, always just put some numbers in there and you will feel uh, things a bit better. Um, so in general, we are hoping to just take this one and divide by the sum of this and that, and then we get to the next generation frequency. And when we do that, um, well, um, basically, I mean, what I, what I could have included here is the entire um, sequence, which is that from the previous slide, you put the, the things in here. You remember that this, for example, was x, y, and then the y itself had a definition that depended on m, um, and we put that in there, and then we uh, plot it with whatever um, program you like, and you get this graph that looks actually a bit similar to the M graph, uh, but it's not entirely uh, the same. Uh, what we have now on the axis here is that we have the current frequency, some sort of assumed frequency of the big A allele in the current generation, and this is then the thing in the next generation. And this one is just the diagonal, um, so that you can see how curved it is. So if the big A males have a five-fold advantage in their mating, but they are causing a 10% reduction in the, male, in the female fitness. So then the question is, do they spread? I mean, it's kind of bad that they are harming every female that they're mating with, so they are actually getting less offspring from these females than if they were nicer. But on the other hand, they seem to be better at finding females in the first place or out competing in the other males when they're also trying to find females. So from this curve, do you deduce that the benefits of, to the males override the costs or not? It's not a trick question. It's, you should be able to look at this. The big A is going to dominate. Yeah. yeah, the big A always increases in frequency except if it's at zero because if it's not there, it cannot increase. There's no input of mutations. And of course, if it's already fixed at 100%, it also cannot get any more uh, prevalent than that. At every intermediate frequency, um, you, you can kind of like do the uh, tracking of the dynamics over time based on this figure alone. Like if you started, for example, from 20%, you would, here would be the diagonal, but you can predict that the future frequency is actually something like, I don't know, 30, 33% or something like that. Then you move to the next generation. You can actually do this horizontally to the diagonal because you are now at 33 or whatever, something like that. And then you can predict that the, that next generation then is 40, let's say 46%. Then you move again horizontally to here, um, the next generation, and you just get this staircase pattern coming there and you all will go to fixation. And in the end, of course, it's a bit of a funny thing because if you predict that it's now fixed, all males have this trait. None of them are actually better than any other male. They are all kind of like got to the situation where all they do is just harm the females. So population fitness, once again, was not maximized in this. And this is actually a sort of general feature of, of many sexual conflict models and in general conflict models. Um, one of my favorite examples actually is I mean, this is a country with a lot of rainforest, and the rainforest has become 
<laughs> very nicely political as well in the last uh, election here. Um, but if you think about why is there actually a rainforest in the first place, why do trees grow so incredibly tall and they are competing for light? And if you think about two trees growing next to each other, the one who is a bit taller than the other is kind of like sh shading, it, it's this sort of sa same elbowing thing that if they all grow to be ridiculously tall and the trunk is actually not productive directly as as kind of like tissue or as uh, it's basically just serving to outcompete others in the competition for light um, and as a whole if you look at the even though a rainforest is really really impressive if you look at it from below because the trees are crazy tall um, if you look at it from above um, the trees aren't actually that much closer to the sun as a whole you know it's, it's just trivial how much they have managed to do the the total resource that they are competing for has not changed because they still get the same number of photons um, but they are all just sort of trying to invest in these things um, just like these males here are trying to invest in out competing each other when they're competing for the females uh, and unlike the trees the males could actually be actively damaging the resource uh, if you think of the females as a resource for them and by the way coming back to the trees because it's not just a sort of joke metaphor that I'm making here, because in agriculture, when people have been breeding um, things to become more efficient as food uh, sources for us, um, it's actually very common that the wild types, they are taller growth forms like wheat and you know, all these sort of ancestral types, um, because they have been sort of trying to outcompete each other, um, at least if they have been growing in dense populations. And humans have been breeding them to be lower, which has two advantages. One is that if it's kind of raining crazy, uh, they are a bit more sturdy, they don't crash so badly. But the other thing is that if there's a trade-off between tall growth and seed production, you actually get more seeds if you allow them to, you're basically imposing group selection on the plants in agriculture. You're choosing the ones that are nice to each other and everybody can have a lot of resources and then you're interested in eating the seeds at least if it's wheat or rice or something like that so it's um, these kind of very simple models they can also help you understand those processes that if you just leave evolution to work on its own it doesn't necessarily maximize what is good for the population and this is an example of it so why is the slide not moving did i do something here i don't know oh there's another, now it should work. Yep. Okay, so the spiky penis or you know, whatever form of male aggression we are thinking about here, it doesn't always evolve in the model. So we can actually look at how bad should the cost to the females be before this sort of ridiculousness stops. Uh, so here's a, an example. So we have the same value of m as before, uh, we have m equals 5. So again, you're five times as good as the other males if you have this big A allele, but you cause a huge reduction in the female's fitness. Um, so only 10% of their egg production is left if you have mated, um, if such a male has mated with them. So now again, uh, the, this here we have the diagonal and we can see that whatever the value of um, these intermediate values of x here, from 50% you get down to 40 something percent and from 40 something percent you go down, so basically you just always have the same kind of staircase but now it's always going down. So this, if this was an innovation um, that the males evolve um, starting from low frequency, you can see that it would never get started, it would never start going upwards, it just gets selected against. So um, this was just a couple of examples, but the model is so simple that it should actually be relatively easy to, for you to think. If you, if you like manipulating e equations, um, it's not a particularly complicated set of equations here. And now I'm going to uh, show you how relatively easily you can actually make this intuition in, um, in an analytical form. Um, so these intermediate steps that so far I was hiding here, uh, this is um, showing them explicitly what you can do. Um, so we have this future generation that I was plotting there. Um, this is the definition and the goal is to work until we have an expression that links x prime 
directly to the previous generation X and then these parameters that we had in there. So, for example, we know that the big A, um, the number of offspring with the big A depends on M because the probability that a mating male has the big A allele depends on M and this is of course influencing who their fathers are. But now we want to make that explicit. So this is the equation that we had already. So this is summarizing all the different routes to getting to those offspring. Um, and then uh, we, what I have done here is to, uh, well, first I just take the big B out because it's just multiplying everything um, in the same way. Um, then I am putting the definitions of these probabilities in place. Um, and then I'm doing the same thing for the small a. And you just have to trust me that this is what it looks like. And so we get to this, which looks a bit like blah, but, but it's not too bad. There's no terrible nonlinearities um, or anything like that, uh, that in there. Um, we can get to this sort of thing. And now we realize that we have actually gotten rid of all the y and other intermediate steps in our calculations. We actually have a direct correspondence or a sort of mapping function from the previous generation to the future generation so that we can start asking when exactly is actually the future generation x smaller or larger than the previous generation one. So when are they equal? That's how we can start uh, thinking about this. And uh, when you do this, um, you just do your manipulations. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you're all quite comfortable with this kind of thing. Um, you get this answer, which is already really quite simple. Because we can then think about, you know, what is actually the condition for the future generation um, to have a larger proportion of these big A alleles in there. Um, and we get to this from which we can look at what happens everywhere else than at the boundaries, like from zero to at, at exactly zero, you know, it's uninteresting because no change is possible. And likewise, if everything is fixed, uh, it's also not interesting. But if we have, if we are um, somewhere in between, then we know that this thing here cannot be negative. So therefore, everything really just depends on whether this, the sign of one minus B M. So the direction of evolution is completely predictable based on whether B times M is greater than one or not. So if you remember B was our way of quantifying how big is the harm to the females. So if B is really low, then the harm is great. They have very little of their fecundity left. And M is the mating advantage of the males relative to other males. Um, and this is quite a logical thing to think about them. If B times M is greater than one, then even though the male is causing harm to the females that he's mating with, um, he's getting so proportionally, um, it's kind of like disproportionately more uh, females um, that he can do this harm to. Uh, so as a whole, it's still a net benefit. Um, and the system then evolves to a state where all females are not harmed because all males are A. So this is, um, even though it's a really simple model, um, I think it's, I'll just wait until the noise is over. The simplicity also has this advantage that you, you can sort of get into this insight uh, that totally makes sense. Um, and you can see that the evolution here is really uh, driven by what is good for the males, um, even in cases where, I'm just repeating myself here, the population fitness really is, doesn't really play much of a role here. But so far when I'm talking about sexual conflict, I haven't actually specified what's, what style of sexual conflict I'm even talking about here. Um, have you heard these terms before, interlocus or intralocus? No, nobody has, so therefore I'm going to uh, introduce them. They, they maybe could be better named, um, it, but you know, this is it, because there's kind of like an assumption of the genetic architecture in here that people usually haven't measured, but it's kind of logical to think about. So this model that I was presenting to you, it was a model of interlocus conflict. 
where um, if you think about, for example, the traumatic insemination of the bed bugs, um, what the males are doing is assumed to be driven by certain loci that the males have. The females might have them as well, but they are not expressed in the females. The females might in reality then evolve some counter adaptations. Like I, I was telling you that they have some immune function that is enhanced in this region and they, the morphology changes and all kinds of things happen. But we make the assumption that these female traits then are different traits. Uh, they, they are not controlled by the same locus that the male anatomy was, was doing. Um, but there's also cases of, yeah, this is basically just what I said. There's also cases of intralocus conflict, um, which is when we are talking about the same traits. And, and there's usually, um, there's a human example that, that is always, it, it's actually a bit contested whether this is actually true, but there's just a recent biological reviews uh, paper uh, saying that it seems to be true that the human anatomy, if you think about the hip width, that um, it's, it's clear that even if you look at fossil humans, uh, you can tell that if they're female or male because adult females have broader hips. Um, and the idea is that this is actually conflict because if the male hip width is so narrow, because they obviously they don't have to give birth, um, then maybe that is actually better for locomotion. Um, and th th this is where the dispute comes in a little bit, kind of like, is it really so bad for the locomotion if your hips are a little bit wider? Uh, there's some literature on this and the, I'm not sure if there's a consensus, but there's certainly an interesting biological reviews paper saying that, um, yeah, there is actually quite nice evidence that if you were just optimizing the thing for locomotion, then you would make the females a bit narrower as well. Um, so this is, it's different from that style of conflict because it's not really about the interaction between the sexes causing problems. Um, it's the fact that as a female, if you inherited the instructions for your skeleton, just kind of a bit like in the previous model, if you just randomly came from the dad and from the mom, and if we didn't have this evolved difference that the genes say that, well, actually now, if I'm developing in a female, I will, and I'm some sort of bone cells, um, I will start growing differently. If we didn't have that difference, we would have unresolved sexual conflict because the females would have problems in childbirth and the males would have, you know, maybe not, probably the problems in childbirth are a bigger problem than the, than the little difference in the locomotion efficiency. But the fact that there is the difference in morphology having evolved, that's when we talk, people talk about resolved sexual conflict, that if it was the same trait without taking into account whether you're in a female or male body, um, it would be a conflict situation, but if you have modifier alleles or something like that, uh, that actually create differences in structure based on the sex, then your conflict has been resolved. Um, so this interlocus conflict is not always resolved, and I'm going to tell about an interesting case called um, salmon maturation time. So this is about the Atlantic salmon very, very delicious fish, and because of that, uh, there's also quite a lot of research um, into, you know, how, how they are actually behaving and, and how, do we, how do we get them back from the ocean to the streams and things like that. Um, and, of course, fishing is also something where people are very interested in how big the fish are. And uh, there's huge variation um, because fish are slow-growing things. Um, fish are, in, in general, most fishes are indeterminate growers. I guess you know that when I say fishes, I mean several different species. And when I say fish, in, even if it's plural, then I'm talking about several individuals. That's English grammar. It's kind of funny. Um, so in a lot of fishes, meaning different species, um, they are indeterminate growers, which means that the longer they have been living, uh, every year, even after they have started producing eggs, or sperm if they're males, um, they can still also add to their body size. Um, and this is important uh, for this story as well. Um, but it's not just that some are small and some are big because um, one of them is older and the other one is younger. Um, they actually have quite a complicated life cycle. 
Uh, it depends a bit on which species. There's lots of different kinds. Uh, some of them only ever come back once and then they die after they have spawned, but then there's others who do um, this repeatedly, uh, so you always have to check which species you're talking about. But the one that I'm talking about, the Atlantic salmon, they are born in fresh water um, and then they migrate to the sea after they have been feeding a little bit in the stream and then they grow there and then they migrate back to the original river. So it's kind of like the opposite from for example, eels that, um, that grow in the streams and then they go back and spawn in the Sargasso Sea and exactly why nature decides that you know, one fish has to do it this way and the other one that way, well, who knows. But anyway, this is, this is the salmon story. But the question is the timing. When do you feel that it's time to start doing this journey back? Um, they can actually cover really, really long distances when they do this. Uh, so uh, they, they grow in the sea, there's a lot of food there, um, they, um, there's different names for this, there's the alevin and then there's a juvenile that is a par, then there's a smolt, then there's an adult, um, and then uh, they come back and reproduce. This is actually a bit wrongly depicted here because the reproduction, of course, I mean the eggs don't actually swim upstream, the adults do and lay the eggs in the sweet water. Um, now this is a classic trade-off situation because there's kind of like benefits and costs to either of these timing actions, staying in the water, staying in the ocean for longer or um, coming back sooner. Um, there's all kinds of benefits when you're staying there for longer because when you get back, depending on where you're from, you know, some of these streams are actually, there's always these fantastic YouTube videos, how much the fish have to fight their way upstream. Um, and if you're not strong enough to do that, you might actually want to wait until you're strong enough. Also, if you're female, then for each journey that you make, if you're a big female, then you get more eggs into the next generation, uh, simply because the, you know, the, the cavity where you're storing your eggs, uh, there's a physical constraint in how much you can do that. If you're a tiny fish, you just cannot produce so many eggs. Um, if you're male, then we again get into the sort of male-male competition things, um, that if it's a situation where you need to fight uh, to get access to the females, um, it might be beneficial to be big, although with males, sometimes in some fish species, you also get these sneaky tactics where it's actually really nice if you're small. You're basically just this tiny fish with huge amounts of sperm inside, and then you just come from behind a rock, and, but that's a separate story. I'm not talking about that one here. Um, so if you just looked at the benefits of being big, then you would predict that you know, at any size, why don't you just think, oh, I'm just going to stay for a little bit longer still. Um, but if you do that to the ridiculous long time frame, then of course you realize that you, you can't stay there forever because any year that you're alive in the sea, uh, bad things could also happen to you because survival of things is never 100%. Um, if you're just waiting in the sea and you're never reproducing, then at some point there's some shark or whatever, fishing net or things like that is going to kill you and you never got any offspring because of that. So every day that you're, you have spent not yet reproducing basically equals one more day during which you could actually die. So um, I'm telling you about the empirical stuff here. Um, I'm, I'm not going to produce an actual salmon model. I'm going to produce a version of the previous model that you already saw, but now just adjusted to the fact that it's uh, intra-locus conflict. Uh, so kind of like the same locus having an effect on uh, males and females um, instead of the interaction, um, males and females interacting with their mating kind of uh, type. But I'm going to tell you the sort of inspiration for thinking about um, intra-locus conflict, uh, because in this case the genetics is actually relatively well, well actually extremely well known. Thanks to Craig Primer, uh, who is an Australian researcher, he works in Finland, um, and they have been looking at the sizes and ages of fish in 57 Norwegian and Finnish rivers where natural spawning still occurs. Uh, there's also rivers where it cannot occur anymore because people have built dams, uh, that's a conservation story that is making fish interested people very angry, but anyway. So um, what you can see here for each of the rivers, 
Uh, in the light blue, this is the proportion of individuals that come back to the river when they are just one year old. So they are not hugely old and they are not hugely big either. And the medium blue are the ones that return as two year olds and the dark blue are the ones that come back when they are three years or older. And you can see that there are some rivers where most fish are really quite young, like this river number 36 here. And there are some other rivers where there's a lot of dark, so, um, so there's interpopulation variation in this trait uh, quite a bit. But you can see that as a whole there's quite a bit of a mix. Um, so most rivers you have young ones coming back and you have older ones coming back. And that of course has an impact on their size. Um, so there's, this is a graph of the, uh, no this is not the size, this is age, sorry. This is the age at maturity uh, when they have chosen to come back to the rivers separately for the females and the males and I'm not telling you yet what's on this axis. But believe me, there's like nine different categories of males and females. Um, and the size of these dots is how many fish in their total sample belong to each category. Um, so there's the sort of old ones. Uh, they have chosen to be at least three years in the ocean before they come back. And then there's the young ones um, that have chosen to be there. They're the impatient ones. Uh, they have come back very quick. And you can see that it's a very similar pattern between the females and the males, except that for the males, there's a big dot here and a small dot for the females. For the females, there's a relatively bigger dot here and a smaller one for the males. And um, I'm still not telling you what's on this axis, um, but this is now, yes. Uh, j just for me to get the, the whole uh, sexual history of them clear, uh -huh. uh, they, they go up, upstream only once, right? And then they die up there, or, or some of them they, come back? Well, um, they, the famous stories, they, the ones that always died, that's the Canadian ones. Okay. Um, so these ones, uh, they, we are actually talking here about their first reproduction. Uh, they can then try again, um, but this is not the main part of the story. Um, so this is about how long do you stay in the ocean before you try your first time. Yeah, um, it's actually, remind me when I get to the end of the story, I should also tell you that when it comes to the genetic architecture, uh, which by the way is on this x-axis here, I will show you that in a moment, um, it looks like different salmon species have gone for very different ways how it's genetically regulated. So one story in one salmon species doesn't actually generalize to another. So it's, it's quite weird, but this is, this is why it's important for me to mention that this is the Atlantic salmon that comes to Europe, uh, Northern Europe to breed. Okay, so um, this one was about age at maturity. Then we can look at their sizes. Uh, so this is size measured in length. And you, it is this actually big fish. I mean, some of them are almost a meter uh, or maybe even bigger uh, than a meter long, which is why it's economically such a valuable fish to think about. There's a question. There is one question from the Ah, okay, you can read it aloud. Yeah. So this one is from Amanda Santana. Can interlocus conflict generate sexual dimorphism and is it associated with only traits or can it influence the preference of females or males for their mates? Okay, so that's that, that's two questions. So the first one's First one was, uh, can it, can you say the first part again? Uh, sorry, I, I started thinking about the second one. Conflict generates sexual dysmorphism. Yeah, yeah, basically, intra locus conflict, um, it's, it's again depending on um, whether you talk about it in the state where it's resolved or unresolved. So the, the starting point um, is, I guess I'm getting, uh, thinking about, you know, the word generate, is it responsible for it or not? But if I think of, again about the, if we accept the human hip width story, uh, let's accept that it's really bad uh, for the females to have two narrow hips because then childbirth is very dangerous and all these kind of things. Um, but if we modeled this, we would have uh, different kinds of loci that you inherit from your father and from your mother. And then, for any particular 
hip width, you would then see that there's selection pressure that makes it go narrower if you're a male, but um, broader if you're female. So the conflict angle there is the fact that the same traits are not optimal for both. And then if we therefore um, have a genetic architecture where this is just the way it is, you can not do anything about it, you know, you only inherit these alleles and your, your morphology is like that, sorry, then we would talk about that as unresolved sexual conflict. And in this case, the sexual conflict has not caused the dimorphism. But if we then think about it, okay, this is a bit of a stupid situation to be in long term, you know, lots of babies die or mothers die or things like that. So you would expect an evolutionary response that there's actually two different possibilities. One is that if the selection on the females is so strong, but you still don't have any mechanisms how you can make the morphology evolve different in males and females, mm -hmm. then you would just get broader hips, but they would be a bit silly that the males have them as well because they don't need them. So again, it wouldn't be dimorphism, but it would be an outcome predicted from sexual conflict theory. But very often, if, if the selection pressures are there, then of course, if there's an innovation, like a modifier allele that says, oh, actually, um, I'm going to have a look at how much testosterone or estrogen or something like that. Um, like if you, if you think about children, you know, their skeletons are actually not that different, but at puberty, things start changing. So what if the growth uh, is starting to be responsive to the hormones that are floating around in the body so that you start not, not stopping the growth in, in this direction when you're female until it's completed. Then um, the sexual conflict, if both, um, if both sexes have reached their optima um, and the conflict is no longer sort of materialized, it's no longer there, then we talk about resolved sexual conflict the problem is no longer there. So yes, you can say that sexual conflict was sort of responsible for this, um, but the, people actually usually talk about the conflict more when it's in the unresolved state, that maybe still it is the case that if, you, if your dad is somebody with particularly narrow hips, then you're, you're sort of staying a bit suboptimal as a female as well, and, and that the conflict is, um, I, and I actually wish I had put a slide in there. I was just um, looking this morning again. There's a new paper on that is using data from the UK Biobank. You know this um, this huge data set on all kinds of. You know, it's, it's of course it's completely anonymized, uh, but it but but it's a huge data set where you can look at what sort of gene variants people in the UK have, and um, there's anonymized information about their health status and things like that. And they, um, if, I think it's still, is it already published or was it a preprint? I can't remember. Um, but they say that there's actually evidence um, of lots and lots and lots of loci where there's evidence that a human contemporary population actually has signs of unresolved sexual conflict in there. Uh, that there are a lot of physiological things that, you know, if, if you're having a bit too much of that when it's actually only needed when you're a male or if you're a female, um, that these, these kind of things are still really quite ongoing when it comes to human health and so on. There was a second part of the question. Um, is it associated with only traits or can it influence the preference of, fem of females or males for their mates? Absolutely, it can influence things. So the, um, yeah, I'm trying to think of a good example because there's of course models about this as well. Um, maybe I'll tell about the modeling part because that came to my, I, I have actually published one of these models where, um, where the question is, you know, if these males are so awful to the females, can't they do something about this? And, and, and there's a debate about it because if a female is, mate, is accepting the matings with these harmful uh, males, then, you know, that's too bad because she gets fewer offspring, but on the other hand, her male offspring are fantastic at forcing then other females in the next generation to mate, so how much does this impact the evolutionary trajectories? And, and there are people, including me, but also others, they have modeled the evolution of female 
resistance traits, uh, like if they can actually say that, well, I would rather kind of, you know, even though you're so good at mating with everybody, I would still like to not mate with you. And, and there's interesting interactions in there. You have to make assumptions about the genetic correlation, like, like in, the, in this world, that I was telling you in the previous model, we actually only had one locus, the big A, small A, they were all in one locus. But if you then had a female expressed trait where they can, ma basically the females would then manipulate how much of an M do the males even get from their uh, actions. Um, so you can start building models that way. Um, I can't think of a really, really nice empirical study to tell about right now in response to that question, but I, I might come back tomorrow when I've, because it's, it's an interesting field. So, yes, absolutely. But back to the salmon. Um, there's, there's the lengths, and you can see that the, the patterns here are quite similar to what you saw there. Uh, like there's very few females that are um, age one and whatever is on this axis. And likewise, there's very few females uh, that are uh, very small and uh, at this value of that axis. So the researchers were interested in what is actually causing these differences. Could it be genetics that some of them are just genetically more impatient to come back from the ocean and others are taking it a bit more easy and eating more and coming back bigger? So the fast and the slow fish, not in terms of swimming speed, of course, but they return in a hurry, the fast ones, while they're still small and young, and the slow ones take their time. And they do this thing that the general, general mix people uh, do these days. I guess, I guess you all know what is a Manhattan plot, or no? Shaking head? Okay, if you're shaking heads, then I'm not an expert in this methodology, but I, I have a lot of friends who do this. Um, so basically, what you have here is the entire genome, um, there's 29 chromosomes in this salmon, and then your, each of these points, it's kind of like a statistical test. Um, you can see that the y-axis is a p-value of whether whatever you are seeing at that locus is correlated with the trait value that you are interested in. So in this case, um, the trait value is at what age did you come back from the sea. And if you get a l very low number here, then you know you just didn't find anything here, really. Um, but then in this case, I mean, these Manha they, they, they're called Manhattan plots because they're these vertical, like, you know, big buildings. Um, and um, you get excited when you get something at a location in a chromosome that seems to have a huge impact on you know, whether you have this allele or that allele seems to predict quite well what phenotype you're observing. And often they're much more messy than this, so these researchers were like totally amazed when they saw a really clear signal. And often you see these dots almost on top of each other because if you think about a chromosome, there's, there's a lot of loci, and if one of them is actually causally responsible for what happens, then of course the locus that is next to it, it also appears to be varying together with it simply because you know the, there's physical linkage between the different loci. So this is why these, this gene or that gene or that gene, it probably does, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with this uh, thing, but, um, but at least something in that region and most likely the top one, that is something that actually is causing um, a thing to happen in your organism. So what did they identify? They, genes always have these fun names, um, and, and, and what, what they found is that there really is two alleles in there, and uh, we can call them E and L for early and late. Um, so the early, early individuals, uh, so salmon of course are diploid, um, so now what I'm going to model is, is still going to be in the haploid world just for simplicity, but of course in reality you have to remember um, that uh, these fish are diploid. So there can be early, early individuals that are either female or male, or there can be late, late uh, individuals that can be female or male, or there can be heterozygotes. So one of their alleles tells the fish to come early and one of the alleles tells it to come late. So what's the fish going to do there? Um, so if we first look at the early, early individuals, you can see that 
sometimes, you know, there's always variation in nature. Sometimes they stay late in the ocean. I don't know what delayed them, uh, even though their genes were telling them to come early. But mostly, you can see that they are among the young ones who come early, and they are also small. Um, whereas the late, late ones, very few of them come early, and most of them come late. And the sex difference here, and this comes to the dimorphism thing, is that it's actually really interesting that if you're a heterozygote, then if you are a female, you mostly actually delay. Whereas if you're a male, you actually mostly come early. And I think this is really interesting because for the females, it's much more kind of like the causality between size and reproductive success is, is quite a bit more direct because, you know, it's just the number of eggs that can fit into a body. So, so it looks a bit like maybe this is a situation, and this is the claim that they make in the paper, that there's this evolutionary pressure for the females to stay quite long in the ocean. For males, not so much, maybe a bit. They can't be too small. Um, and, and in this case, there, there is some hint that this situation is partially resolved by the intermediate fish actually responding to their own sex and deciding that well, in quotes, deciding that um, if I'm a female, then I interpret these mixed physiological signals by going a bit towards the late side. So um, there's something in this particular chromosome, 25, that impacts when or at which size a salmon sort of feels that it's ready to go. Um, but yeah, this, this is basically just sort of when you know something about the system, you can, you can then say that um, even without genotyping this salmon, I would imagine that this is probably um, has a particular uh, genotypic composition on its 25th chromosome. Um, and this is because, you know, this is what the size graph looks like. Uh, so the really, really big males, um, I don't know how much this is in centimeters, but it looks like it's, it's something like a meter. Um, firstly, um, you could see the male morphology in there, but secondly, you know, the, none of these mixed or early ones, they really reach these uh, incredibly high sizes. Well, maybe, maybe this confidence bar goes in there. So um, even though the diploid is actually part of the story, I'm, I'm just going to keep the math simple for um, a little bit still um, and go back to the haploidy case. Um, I will actually go a bit more towards uh, proper genetics in an elephant story that is also coming, but we'll see if we manage today or if that has to be left until tomorrow. Um, so, so the reason that I want to do this haploid is not really because of the salmon, uh, because after all the diploid is quite interesting there, but because I just want to s go back to the model that you already saw and see how much changing just one assumption how much of a difference it makes to the outcome. Um, so, and the one assumption is that I'm moving from interlocus to intralocus world. So now I'm assuming that this big A allele that you're already familiar with, it is also expressed in the female um, and it's doing something uh, bad there. So the only difference to the previous model that I'm making here, and this is maybe a general lesson if you're doing biological modeling, um, it's quite useful if you, if you do quite a sort of careful exploration of the entire space so that if you change lots of assumptions at once, then of course you don't really know what is like responsible for the differences between the models. So this is why, it's, why I'm still trying to sell you the interest of looking at this haploid model, uh, that if we only change one thing, see how much can the results change. So now we remove the assumption that the male's big A has anything to do with your fecundity if you're a female. And instead we say that it's your own female, so you're, I'm a female, my own big A that makes my brood size be multiplied by this number that is smaller than one. And all I, therefore that I'm doing is that I'm shifting this B to another location and I'm shifting this B to another location. And if this goes too fast, let's just have a look at what that means. Uh, so previously we had the, this was the, it's always the female first and the male. So this, if the female was small a and the male was big a, that's when you get the penalty. 
Whereas now I'm saying that you get the penalty if you yourself as a female have the big A um, and the male can be anything. Uh, and um, this, so the B disappears from here uh, because the big, the female is small a and therefore she's fine regardless of what the male is. And everything else about the model is the same. So I'm not repeating all the steps. The analysis goes exactly in the same way. But I get these very different kind of curves. And I guess the more interesting one is the one where m equals uh, 5. I've got a smaller m here as well. And now I've actually made the b really quite low. So you have, it's really bad for the females to have this big A allele. Uh, they have only 30% the fecundity of the, the ones who have the small A allele. Um, so how do you interpret this graph? Does somebody want to say something? Yeah. I, I just, want to ask, yep. just want to ask if the M, it still applies to the males. Uh, yes, the M still applies to the males. So the males are now better um, at getting to the females uh, when they have the big A allele, but they are not harming the females. The females are just harming themselves if they have the big A allele. So what happens in this figure? Yeah, coexistence. Um, in other words, polymorphism. Um, so usually when we talk about a within species uh, thing, um, we often use the word polymorphisms, like they're two different morphs. So there's the big A and, and small a, um, and these morphs are coexisting. So this is a, a polymorphism because you can see that when you are below this value, which is it's probably exactly 0.6, I'm not entirely sure, but the numbers are quite simple, so it's probably like that. Um, if you're below that, for example, 40 percent, you can see that the future um, allele frequency is higher than 40 percent, so we move, the staircase moves like this, whereas if you're high up there, and this is probably exactly how your thought process went, if you're higher, you move lower, if you're lower, you move higher. Um, the equilibria that are, these are kind of like the trivial equilibria, if one of the alleles is completely absent, it's still true that it cannot become present, so from zero you just stay at zero, but this is an unstable equilibrium, meaning that if you have a tiny bit, the first ever mutant uh, that happens to arise here, it will actually be selectively favored um, and it will go up. So again, this was a case where um, the population in the end will not have maximized this population fitness because it would be maximal if the females were all like not, not having to pay this cost, small b. Um, but it's different from the previous case because this polymorphism never happened in the previous model. It would, they, they were always much simpler, um, these curves that are always either uh, fully above or fully below. And we already did the analytical math so that there was, there was just no chance for this intermediate equilibria. Um, the intermediates don't always happen. So this is, for example, a case where um, you have a small, this is just a 50% benefit to the males and the females, this is still quite a big cost, but it's only 10%. It's not like a 70% cost like it was here. And you can see that things just go simply to fixation like they did in the previous model. So before I move to the elephants, um, other questions about this general theme? Yeah. Uh, understood this case, but I'm still a bit confused. In this mm -hmm. case, the big A means that they arrive later. Is the later gene? No. Um, in the salmon, you mean? Yes, in the salmon. Yeah, in yeah. So here I I call them E and L. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, so this was not. So the correspondence between the salmon story and this other story, it's not complete because you know you have the heterozygous and things like that. But the interesting thing here about the salmon, and I think this is a shared feature, is that there keeps being this mix. You know, the, there's all these rivers, and most of the rivers had you know early and two year and three year. Um, all the all these kind of things are in there, and it's a bit of a funny one. It's actually something that I'm really interested in biology as a whole. How come we have so much diversity? 
Uh, we have polymorphisms within a species. We have coexistence between species. If you go to the rainforest again, you know, there's not just one way of succeeding in there. There's, there's so amazingly many things. So how, based on a limited number of resources that you're competing for, um, you can get actually so many different ways of succeeding. That is, that is a really big biological question. And I think it's really interesting that this is a case of clearly intra-locus conflict because it's the same, you know, this, these plots that they have, um, even though this is actually pooled data, so they have the females and the males in the same one. But if you did it separately for the females and males, you would find that both of them show the same pattern. So it's the same locus and it's telling them to come early or late, but then on the other hand, you're a male or a female, so how, how do you do this? Um, and it looks like um, the outcome is that variation is maintained. And the model is predicting that if you have certain problems that where it's kind of like, you know, this could be good and this could be bad, but on the other hand, if you're female, it's good, but if you're on a male, it's kind of bad, um, then that it can produce the mixed equilibrium uh, where you don't go f to fixation, but you don't also don't go extinct. Um, that's the analogy there, but, but it's not a fully fledged salmon model with the timings and things like that. The elephant model is going to be much more about one particular species. So this is what I'm going to tell you about next. And this was actually, I was chatting to some of you yesterday and uh, I mentioned elephants uh, and, and then I reread the paper yesterday after the lectures and I decided to actually um, tell you a little bit about how, how you can read something and you can actually start modeling it. So I, I literally did this yesterday and it's not as complete as it would be otherwise because um, just elephants are so annoyingly long-lived <laughs> that it makes the matrix really big. Um, but, the, but, but it's such a fascinating story that I felt like it actually fits quite nicely into the lecture. So this is new material and I thought I will put it in there because also in my future teaching I could develop this a bit further and this is actually, it was a good sort of momentum for me to um, start putting it in there. But forget about elephants at first, um, because um, this, it's almost more fun if I had not mentioned that this is a, going to be about elephants, because the, the, the genetics is much better known for humans. And humans have, like, you know, the medical literature is so huge. We know a lot about the genetic basis of various diseases and risks of diseases, and sometimes kind of like direct developmental abnormalities. And uh, this is about tooth development. And I, I, I was almost thinking about showing you some of the medical pictures of teeth when the development hasn't gone nicely. Uh, they're quite ugly, but you know, you just have to believe me. Um, and this is one of the genes. Um, it's actually kind of like a complex. Uh, nearby, there's a lot of um, genes uh, that have to do with exactly how you form the sort of root and the, you know, the outer layers and all that. And um, if you have mutations in this, this particular gene, there's also others nearby, um, they are bad news and they, they are, the phenotype is particularly unhealthy if you're a male. And actually when I read the elephant paper, they, they kind of oversimplify the medical literature a bit and they, they say that it's lethal for males. Um, when I read the medical literature yesterday, I realized that actually you can survive as a male, but your teeth, you know, the, the whole thing just, you know, you really need to go to a dentist from a young age and they put some artificial stuff in there because it just doesn't work. Females also have uh, no abnormal teeth, um, humans, I'm talking about humans now, uh, and particularly the, the incisor teeth, the, these ones here, they're, they're really tiny, but also the others, they, they don't sort of work as intended. Um, but then when I read the medical literature and compared it with the elephant story that I'm going to tell you about, I was wondering if the medics actually know everything about this because may, if developmental abnormalities happen to be particularly bad, um, it might also be that the embryo just gets aborted. Like in humans, we know that about a third of the pregnancies just get aborted spontaneously without, often without the mother even noticing that she's pregnant. And this is just quite a normal rate. Lots of mammals do this. And when medics, on the other hand, when they look at these phenotypes, um, they say that, well, the male survived, he just has very bad teeth. Um, then, of course, they are looking at the subsample of those who did survive. 
So I'm actually not sure how lethal this actually is in males, in humans or not, because we, if they get aborted very early, we just don't get the samples. So this is where my knowledge about this gene ends. Um, but what I want to come to is the elephants. Um, so this is um, a really exciting story. It was published quite exactly a year ago. Um, this is the first author. Um, who is interested in all kinds of stories um, about evolution in the Anthropocene. And what has he found? So, um, in Mozambique, there was a civil war that lasted a terribly long time, and what often happens in these situations is that even if you're trying to have regulations on how to use natural resources, uh, for example, that ivory trade is bad and it should be banned, uh, the regulations just break down, and there was a lot of poaching. Poaching, I guess you know the word, it's illegal hunting of, uh, in this case, elephants. And um, now to the teeth. The tusks that is the source of ivory, um, if you had an abnormal development that makes you tuskless, as an elephant, it's fantastic news if you live during a civil war in Mozambique. Um, and this seems to have happened. So this, these are some data um, slides from this uh, paper. Um, so the, it's not like they have become completely tuskless, but if you look at the proportions, um, here's data from earlier. Um, so two, the dark blue here means that the female has both tusks. Then it's quite interesting. They can get these asymmetries where they have just one, or then they can have none at least none visible. It looks like they actually have a bit inside, but it's not long enough to come through the skin. And if you look at the proportions, um, it's, it's maybe not a sort of absolutely huge change, but actually, you know, compared to the lifespan of an elephant, you can see that this is, this is a lot. Um, so 68.5% of the female elephants, uh, the males always have them, and I'll come back to that, 68.5% of the females had two tusks. It dropped to 40.7%, um, and more than half of them were actually completely tuskless. And now, um, later, uh, this has started increasing again. So, what is really interesting about this story is the following two slides, or two uh, graphs here. Um, because you can make some guesses about the genetic architecture of this trait. Um, you can look at the mother, and, and now they have simplified, they have sort of not looked at the mothers that have just one tusk. If you have two tusks or zero, you can see that the two tusked elephants, mothers, they have pretty much all of their female offspring have two. Whereas, if you have none, then it's kind of biology is always a bit uh, confusing there so there's some always here in the, in the in the immediate one but you can sort of see that about half of them have two tasks and about half of them have no tasks so it's it's something where you can start deducing what actually happens you know how how does this genetic architecture work that inheritance produces these ratios but especially when you look at this graph here which is the proportion of female offspring, and now notice the graph actually starts at 0.5 here. So it's kind of like not significantly different from 0.5. There's no star here. Um, if your mother has two tasks, then half of her young are female and half of her young are male. Whereas it's something like two thirds female if you have no tasks. And now you can sort of start thinking like, you know, what is going on in here? Combine that with the biomedical literature on the humans, which is also a little bit messy, but they have done genomics in there. They have, they have really figured some things in, uh, out there. So one thing that I didn't mention about the AMELX gene yet is that it's on the X chromosome. And that has a huge impact on things. So we, we could maybe start deducing something from these facts that there's actually no reduction in the probability that males have tusks in this population. Um, so all these graphs, they were about the females. And the tuskless females have one third of their offspring being male, two thirds are female. So what if we assume 
that having this modifier, I, I just call this now with this asterisk, uh, this X asterisk um, now means uh, that you have an X chromosome that has the mutated AMELX gene. So if we assume that males die if they have this mutated X, then all the males actually have to be normal XY. Uh, they, so I'm just making an assumption here. Uh, whereas the females can be either XX or X, um, I'll just call this X, well, this is not a prime, this is an asterisk, but a prime is easier to pronounce, so it's, um, I'll just call this an X prime. So, so this is the tuskless elephant female, heterozygous for this trait. Um, this is the female, this is the male. And what kind of offspring can she produce? So it could be that we take the left of the two chromosomes from either of them, so we get an XX, which is a female offspring that develops tusks, okay? Female. Then it could be that we inherit the X prime and the X, um, so we get this tuskless female offspring. It could be that this happens, that we get the um, X prime and the Y chromosome. Uh, this is a male, but this is not a male that is viable. I'm assuming this now. And then we can have the, this chromosome X and this Y coming together, so you get a normal male. So if this dies, everybody else lives, then basically you get a prediction of a one-third of a sex ratio. So it seems to fit the data. They have also done genomics in here. Um, but here I felt like, you know, this could actually be fun uh, for us to, uh, or for me yesterday, to try to build a little bit of modeling of this. And I, um, I'm just so old that I grew up with MATLAB, um, and therefore I, I decided to, to do it there. Yeah? The proportion of males and females in elephant populations is asymmetric. It is yeah, I mean, it, so, so sex ratios is something that I will have a complete lecture about. It's coming quite soon. Okay. Um, right now, I don't remember if they produced figures for the adult sex ratio in there. Um, they did certainly produce the result that you know the, the tuskless females are common and they only have one third of male offspring. Um, so therefore you would expect that the adult sex ratio also becomes biased. Um, in general, in populations, um, adult sex ratios can often be quite biased. In human populations, they are often not, and, and maybe because of that, it's often not easy for people to realize just how biased adult uh, sex ratios can be in animal populations. Um, if they are very female biased, it's often actually not particularly bad news because one male can fertilize a lot of females in most systems. And often, especially in mammals, males live more dangerous lives than females, so they die younger and then the adult population becomes female biased. In birds, it's actually often interestingly the opposite. Birds often do dangerous things when they're female uh, because they are parenting is a bit more egalitarian in birds than in mammals generally, but female birds often do more of the actual incubation. And that's surprisingly dangerous because when you're sitting on the nest and you're not really seeing everywhere and the, if a nest predator comes and if you're still on the eggs, you also get killed. Um, and also the, the things that kill males in mammals, uh, they are often not as strong processes in birds because if you think about Males in mammals are often bigger physically, and that's actually, even though like if you're a fish in the ocean, it's usually safe to be big, but if you're big as a mammal, it can be surprisingly unsafe in case there's, for example, a food shortage. You are the one who, who is more vulnerable to that when you're trying to grow as a juvenile. And there's also other factors that might explain this. Oh, I, I, yeah, I should mention that in birds, the sexes are often the same size, uh, flight dynamics and things like that. They, they don't usually differ so much in size as do mammals. Um, and then there's this additional hypothesis why, why there's this sort of male versus female lifespan difference going the opposite way in birds versus mammals, which is that mammals have an XY system, birds have this ZZZW system, where it's actually the female who is the heterogametic sex. So ZW is a female. And that means that 
all these problems that you can have because you have only one chromosome of a particular kind, uh, they attack females in birds, but they attack males in mammals. And because of all these reasons, um, it tends to be a pattern that um, females on average live shorter lives in birds uh, and females on average live longer lives in mammals on average. Uh, there, there's exceptions like in those birds like like a lot of the relatives of chicken, they sort of grouse and you know, you know things that gather together like turkeys and the males are big and they're fighting and they, they're almost like honorary mammals because they, they sort of do similar things. Um, they tend to have also mammal-like adult sex ratios. I went quite on a tangent from this, <laughs> but, but, I, but I think there's a majority of females in this population probably by now. Um, but I will actually have some slides later in the course why that is not necessarily a hugely big deal. It's of course sad for the mother if her, half of her sons die. But um, I still have 10 minutes, so I could start. Um, doing what I was playing with um, and this is I'm actually planning to teach um, switch my teaching to R or Python or something like that for the future. But I because I grew up using MATLAB, I'm just sort of still quicker at uh, doing it uh, in MATLAB. So um, the syntax doesn't really it, it's, it's quite similar across all platforms. Um, and it's always a bit slow to start, so let me just wait for this to happen. In while waiting, you can ask other questions. God, why are you so slow? The salmon yep. thing. Yep. Uh, how do they track whether the salmon has ever uh, gone upstream before, or, or um, it good. seems difficult. Yeah, yeah. How how do they know it's the first time? I should probably email Craig and ask because I actually don't know the answer to this. Um, I uh, he 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 works at the institute where I did my um, sabbatical earlier this year, so we. Uh, I, I know him quite well, so he would have an answer to this question. Uh, I mean, I, I know that some studies, they have actually tagged um, individuals and you can actually, you know, there are, there, there are this amazing, I, I think this one is not like that because you cannot do that in 57 different streams and that would be like crazy and you're trying to get an overall idea of this. Um, but I do know some studies, uh, they have tagged fish and especially if you are looking at, like in Switzerland, they did a really fun study where there are lakes and there are streams and you have an analogous uh, thing but, but they are just sort of moving between the lakes and the streams and because the entrance to the stream is narrow enough you can put this, it's the same technology as when you go to a supermarket and you beep something and it's, it, it signals that you know this, this credit card or this something came close enough to, what's the, what's the word for that? Well, well you know the technology, this sort of beeping thing and if you put these things in some part of the fish and they go past such a device, uh, then basically just tracks all the entrances and exits. So technology has been able to resolve some of these uh, things. There's also um, the possibility, so fish can be aged quite nicely, but just once because you have to kill the fish because they have this, um, otoliths they're called, uh, they have almost like growth rings uh, in the ear structure. Um, so if you have a dead fish, you can tell exactly how many years it's been alive. But that, of course, is not exactly answering your question, like, you know, where was it in the meanwhile? So um, I guess what Craig might reply, but I'm, I'm just guessing here. Um, I, I will send him an e email um, and see if I get a better answer, is that um, they are assuming that it's quite a low proportion that ever come back, so that if you get the you know, the most individuals that you catch are the ones who do it the first time. But I will, I will check with him. And there's also the fact that uh, there's variation in their sizes in the, and probably in their uh, capability to navigate the river and the like. So that probably affects their catching to, to, to do such, to add chips or the like. So uh, that 
to, to do the, the, the statistics of it, probably considering uh, the catching probability of each of those would be important. Yeah, so, so exactly how they did the sampling. Um, yeah, I, I don't actually know. Yeah, it's, but, but it's, it's certainly true that whenever you're sampling something and you're trying to think about whether your data are unbiased, um, what the data do show, I mean, if you remember the different streams, is that certainly fish, individuals of all kinds of sizes are in there, um, and you can get them small, you can get them large. Whether it's a representative sample of everything, who knows, but I would imagine that if a certain size fish is hard to catch in one river, it's probably also hard to catch in another river, so that at least kind of like, you know, the bias would act in the same way everywhere. But I'm, I'm really just hand-waving here. I, I'm not an author of the study. Um, don't worry about that warning. I, I just shifted to a different structure of the, uh, where I have my files. Oh, that's harmless. Um, so what I did was to create a function called elephant. And it looks a bit long, um, and I should probably make the font larger, but most of it is just plotting. Uh, the actual biology is very... Okay, zoom in. Zoom in more. The actual biology is very brief here, so I'll explain what I did. So this is yesterday's uh, news. Um, so what I'm assuming here is that there's a survival of each elephant from one year to the next. And there's a hunting mortality. These are the inputs. And I'm making some other assumptions here that um, is tracking what we know about this system. And I have five minutes left, so we'll see if I can produce one graph after, um, after explaining what happens in here. And I, this, I, I'm first just sort of putting the notation in place, um, so because the population I'm going to split in three different types of individuals. There's females that have the, I'm, I'm calling the small b now for having the tiny teeth that don't even go out of the skin. So they're kind of like the mutant ones that are safe from um, hunting, um, but all their, no, half of their sons die. Um, then these are the tusk, tusked females and then the males and they always have tusks uh, because I'm assuming that you could actually keep track of the uh, male category who are inheriting the kind of funny uh, X chromosome but because they all die I realized at some point I don't actually have to keep track of them I can just sort of put the indices just tracking three different types of individuals and uh, let's do this for a thousand years which is a bit long for the, uh, this particular ecological study, but then at least I can see if things stabilize. And I'm, um, I have two different um, scenarios here because I realized that it's interesting to compare them. One is the N, no mutant, that this, this style, the taskless females, never appeared. And I'm just tracking the dynamics, what happens if everything is just completely normal. Um, and then uh, I have this NM, which is the M uh, population this is now not M as in male or mating advantage or anything like that. I'm, I'm always switching between different notations. You have to realize that different projects have different notations. Don't get confused. Ha here M s simply signifies that I'm starting the population with one mutant who is a female. So uh, I'm initializing, so this, this NAN here means um, I'm initializing a matrix where there's a thousand years, uh, three columns, um, and that is basically just NAN, not a number uh, that I haven't computed anything yet. I'm initializing the first row so that we have no mutants and we have a thousand females that are normal and a thousand males. And here, instead of a thousand females that are normal, as in tasked, I have one mutant that is taskless, 999 and a thousand, okay? Then I'm just running this for a uh, thousand years. And then I looked up some elephant facts. Um, I did this yesterday, uh, that an adult elephant, uh, and this is by the way where I chose to simplify this just because I was a bit lazy. 
I decided that a newborn elephant becomes an adult elephant within a year. Um, in reality, this is not true, and I will uh, talk about that tomorrow, uh, how much that might have an impact. But I just decided to kind of, for the sake of this quick example, um, I decided that everybody becomes an adult pretty quickly. And if you're an adult female, then um, they, they have this incredibly long gestation of 22 months. Uh, so it's uh, one of the longest uh, that there is in nature. And then they have to lactate um, um, for a bit until they can ever become pregnant again. Um, so therefore, what I read is that every three to four years they can actually produce a calf. And I just put that 3.5 there as a, you know, this is three to four years. So the reproductive rate is one over 3.5. Um, and then I put the assumptions of what we just heard in there. Um, and I have one minute time, so I'm not going to show you any graphs, but I'll just go through the, this line and then we'll continue tomorrow. Um, so I'm taking the previous year, this is now the no, no mutants there population. Um, I'm looking at those females that would be mutants and you realize that this is completely pointless because this will always be zero but you know just to make these two lines comparable it doesn't harm to have them there and then this is just the outcome of what they produce um, so the sum of these things adds to three quarters whereas the sum of the normal ones adds to one so for each of the calves that they produce you have a normal sex ratio among the tusked elephants, and this sums up to one, so one calf is certainly produced, whereas in a quarter of the cases here, nobody is actually produced, because these are the males who died. And of those that are produced, uh, it's basically equal chances you get a male, or you get this is the two-thirds of them being female, so this is two-thirds and this is one-third of that total, right? So one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, and this is capturing the biology of the system the way we assume it works in the elephants. And this is where I've run out of time, so we just continue tomorrow and see what this actually produces. All right? I guess there's coffee? Yes. That would be fantastic. Yes. Can I just take a look on the slides of the B and M equations?